Father in heaven, we bow our heads this, this morning, Lord, in humble adoration of your graciousness and your mercy and of your loving kindness that endures forever, Lord. For, for those in here, Lord, I know that there's not a family in here that isn't touched with someone that isn't saved. And we've been praying for them. And they've also been praying for them, Lord. I pray that their hearts would be encouraged, that you are always right on time. And uh, for those who don't know you, Lord, I pray that they see your face this morning and hear your voice. And uh, we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, my testimony is a little painful to share, but I'm sure it was nothing like the crucifixion of our Savior. So I am honored and privileged to share it with you. When I was in the third grade, there was a knock on the door of the trailer that I lived in with my mother. Uh, me and my sister were taken from her and put into a shelter. We went from that shelter to a foster home where I lived for two years, and it was a, a beautiful, beautiful family. Um, they were Christians, and they, they took us to church on Sunday and on Wednesday, and I learned who Jesus was. I learned John 3.16. I learned that Jesus lived a sinless life, died on a cross, and was rose from the dead. And through him, we have forgiveness of sins. Um, and we were moved from that foster home to another foster home. In this foster home, there was no church. Um, nice lady, though, by the grace of God, um, all the foster homes that I went to were very good. I just want to, before I go any further... Just let me say that even though I was outside of Christ for 43 and a half years, God was very kind and gracious to me. And as we read in the scriptures, in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, it says the Almighty God is kind even to the ungrateful and to the evil. And he was so gracious over my whole life um, and kind. And I moved, as I was in the second foster home, my father was supposed to come and pick us up and he didn't show up and that woman had to move to California. So we had to go to another foster home at this point. They took my sister and put her in one that was all girls. They put me in one that was all boys. Oh, a piece of my heart and hope left with my sister. As I went into the third foster home, still with hope that my father would come visit me um, and come pick me up, he was, the counselors came and told us that he had been killed. Um, so darkness came over me in the form of loneliness. Um, and that would prevail over me for the next 30 years. But I will share what happened. Um, I did something in that third foster home that was humanly impossible to forgive. I don't know if that family sought the Lord to be able to forgive me, but they disciplined me for that. And um, I didn't know that discipline was the greatest show of affection that a parent can give to their children in love. And I hardened my heart and I thought that they hated me. And I told them I didn't want to be there anymore. So from there... I moved into a group home, and for the next three and a half or four years, I was in and out of group homes, detention centers, and halfway houses. Anything that a young man could do to get in trouble, I did. It was to the point when I was 16, they couldn't keep me in the detention center anymore, so they put me in the county jail. From the county jail, they put me in a halfway house down in Fort Myers, and my mother came and visited me. She said that you could come home. And all of those circumstances and situations that were outside of me, I thought were outside of me. And I thought when I go home, everything's going to be fine. Two and a half years later, after I was home, I took my first trip to prison. And as you go into the prison, they give you a piece of paper. The paper says, what's your mother's name? What's her maiden name? What's your dad's name, living or deceased? Then there's a little question, and it says... What's your religious preference? And there's a little box next to Christian. And I checked the box. I checked.
checked it. I know John 3.16. I know that Jesus is risen and that we have forgiveness of sins. I didn't know that there was supposed to be outward evidence of an inward change. I didn't know that my affections weren't supposed to be bent on hell. They were supposed to be bent towards heaven. And not inward to myself, but outward to other people. I didn't know that. I got out of prison, met a young lady. Um, 18 months I was out. Six months of that was on the run. And when I went to prison, that young lady that I met had a son while I was in prison. It was mine. And I walked around that prison thinking when I leave, I'm going to be the best dad. And my kids won't have to go to foster homes. They won't know what that is. I can't put that on the ground and walk in it outside of this and outside of the love of Christ. And I destroyed that family. Is there anyone in here right now that would love to just go to the cross for me? Anybody? There is one that I'm as stunned as you were and I don't think he'd do it. And I go to prison. That was the, that was the second time. I, after I destroyed that family, I met another young lady later in a few years. Um, she asked me if I was a Christian. She asked me that I believe. I said, yeah, I believe. Yeah, John 3.16, I'm a believer. I did not know that time that there was a difference between a believer and a Christian. The Bible says that the demons believe and they shudder. They're not Christians. There's a big difference. Um, and this woman that I met, I married. And we have a daughter. Um, as I would lay in the bed with my wife and daughter in the middle, I would trace my fingers through my daughter's hair and think, what a beautiful child. This is my daughter. And this is my wife. But there was no ark. You know, there was love. But love is the measure of the ability of a person to lay down one's life for the sake of another, regardless of the outcome of their own life. And this only comes from heaven. And uh, as I was in addiction and drugs, it came to a point that my wife had to protect her children from their dad and had to protect herself from her husband afraid of me and she asked me if I couldn't get fixed did she have to go and I left my family is anyone here would care to go to the cross for me and there is only one that does that and I don't know him but I'm a believer I did not know at this time to struggle against sin outside of conversion it was like struggling in quicksand the more you struggle, the deeper you sink. And uh, I was in an apartment by myself one evening. And I did everything that I could do that I might not wake up when I laid down. And to add to that, I prayed to God that he would take my life. And I said in Jesus' name, amen. Two months later, I would spend a year in rehab. My wife came to visit me, bring my daughter. She's so merciful and so gracious. And so willing to fight for her marriage and for her children. Two months after I got out of rehab, I was on my way to prison a third time. They give you that paper. What's your religious preference? Christian, I checked the box. I'm a believer. Why wouldn't I check the box? As I went through that prison, that prison sentence, praying that God, you know, God help me, fix me. Uh, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like that. I wasn't praying that I might be saved or that I might have faith to believe in Him and that whatever He decides for my life is best. I just wanted to be a regular dead person I didn't want to go to jail I didn't want to be on drugs but I also didn't want to be like Christ and if I did I didn't know what he looked like um, 
And he was under no obligation to me when I prayed by precept, by principle, or by promise because I was not his child. But he is kind even to the ungrateful and to the evil. I got out of prison and for about three months I visited my daughter and my wife still. She is in hope that this is going to work. My daughter was loving me and I'm loving her. But there is still no ark. And six months after I was out of, out of prison, I went to jail. In Florida, they have what they call a Prisoner Release Reoffender Act. If you commit any of these ten crimes, if it's not a PRR, if you're just a regular Joe and you do this, you might get ten years. But if you just got out of prison within three years and you commit any of these crimes, you can get anywhere from 15 years to a life sentence, and I'm looking at 30 As I was growing up, God never left me destitute. He continued to send, send people in my life that would put their arm around me, try to love me, care for me, and say, son, you're going the wrong way. You're going to get yourself in some trouble that you're not going to get out of. You're going to spend your life in prison. And I had finally done it. Um, where this crime happened, the guy next door was a pastor at the Village View Church in Ocala, Florida. And I, being guilty... He went to the church and appealed to the congregation and they prayed for me that God might have mercy on me. And in three weeks, I was released from jail on bond. And two weeks after that, all the charges were dropped. And I thought, wow, this is a great mercy. And I set out to pay God back. We read in the 17th chapter of Acts. The God who created the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. I lasted about, I thought that going to church might do God a favor. This is going to help him out. It's going to show him I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I'm a believer, you know. Um, I would spend the next four years or six years in and out of jail. Um, and finally, in 2012, I made my fourth trip to prison. Um, I am. They hand me that paper with that question, with that box, and I checked it. No one in my life ever stopped to check my spiritual pulse. Are you a believer? Yeah. You're not going to feel a pulse, a spiritual pulse like that. Are you a Christian? That would probably be the better question. And it's best that we know what that is. I didn't. I checked the box again. Uh, two years into this sentence, I would look at the younger guys. 1920, I was like, Phew, I was here for that. 24, 25, 26, I was here for that. 32, 33, 34, 35, I was here for that. 42, 43, I'm here for that. And as I consigned myself that this must be my life, there is no possible way that God can save me. I've gone too far. Now, at that time, I didn't know that the distance between heaven and earth, that the God of the universe has spanned that distance and came. Now, I could tell you that it came and all that. But until we can span that distance from heaven to earth, we can never outgo the outstretched, his, his outstretched arm and his willingness to save us. But I didn't know that. Um, Two years into the sentence, a friend of mine comes and he says, hey man, these ministries that are coming in this prison, this is in June 2014, he says, in November and December they'll be bringing food. If we start going now, we won't look like the hypocrites that are going to show up just to get the food. Now, I, I, think I, I think I should have known then that I was going to be a Baptist. But, so, so, so uh, yeah. So uh, we went, and we went to everything. We went to the 
Seventh day Adventist, Spanish Seventh day Adventist, Pentecostal, Spanish Pentecostal, the dispensationalists, the, Bath- the Catholics, and the Baptists. Everybody that came. Um, just, just a part of God's redemptive plan. When we look at it, uh, we can't. Even we we can't even grasp all that he's got going on, but he stirred in the heart of all of those people that came from all of those churches before Hugh had ever went to prison, before Hugh had ever got there. And the scriptures say, um, like, how does this happen? Someone's reading the Bible as a group, as a church, or as a family, a husband and wife, I don't know. But they read, Master, when did we see you in prison and sick and come visit you? And Jesus says, whenever you have done it, To one of the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. And this stirs in the heart of people that don't know me. These people were anywhere from 30 to 73 years old was the oldest one. Most of them victims of, by people like me and victims of crimes of everyone that was in that prison. But God had broken into their hearts, hearts and broken into their lives and press the desire for the people that they had been victimized by to love them and to bring the light of the gospel. Three weeks into this, we're going to get some food ordeal. Um, I walk into a room. It's an African-American church out of St. Petersburg. Um, and as I stop and I go to tell my friend, I'm like, I don't know if they're going to want us here. The lady says, oh, no, you're in the right place. Come in and sit down. So we came in and sit, sat down. And uh, they sang a couple of really beautiful songs. And uh, she opened her Bible to Mark's gospel, chapter 3. And she shares the story of the man with the withered hand. And Jesus says, stand forth and stretch out your hand. And it's on the Sabbath day. And Jesus makes his hand as whole as the other. And the woman says, she's not talking to me specifically. She says, Jesus knows what's wrong with you. And he wants to heal you. And he doesn't care if it's the Sabbath day. He don't care what day it is. And for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel. And the light of the gospel was spread into my heart and into my life. And over that darkness that I walked in for 43 and a half years. And I knew that the God that was in heaven had looked upon me down into my soul, down to the very marrow of my bones. And he didn't look at me and condemn me. I had condemned myself way before he condemned me, before he will condemn you. And he didn't condemn me. And as I left there, I thought, yeah, what about God? What about that? And he says, I paid for that. I said, no. What about my wife and kids? I left them. I, said, I, I, I paid for that. What about, what about that? I, said, I paid with my life for that. I said, you can't forgive me. He said, I can. I will and I have. And then it started coming quickly. Go into another class. This guy comes in. He's sharing about mercy and grace. I don't know the difference. I'm not raising my hand to ask. The guy next to me. <laughs> yeah. The guy next to me raises his hand. He says, sir, I don't know the, dis- the difference between mercy and grace. And he says, I'm glad you asked. I didn't come into this prison that I might leave so that you don't know this. That's why I'm here. And he says, grace is what God gives us that we don't deserve. And mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. And again, this God that I knew that could see and that didn't condemn me, it was oh so merciful. And then I moved into another class, another day of the week. And this guy is sharing his life, his testimony about how he drowned when he was a child. A man pulled him out of the, of the lake resuscitated him, he got home, told his parents, this man saved me, they figured, they found out who the man was, took their son to his house, knock on the door, the man opens the door, he's standing behind the screen door, and this guy's 73 years old, bringing the 
gospel into a prison. He says, he looks up at the man. He says, sir, I want to thank you for saving my life. The man looks down at him. He says, son, if you want to thank me for saving your life, you'd live a life that was worth saving. And as he grew up, he always would hear that man's voice. And I thought, I would love to live a life that was worth saving. Surely it's too far gone. What is God going to use me for? I have, I'm, I'm saved now though for sure. The light of the gospel is in there. And that, the darkness can't overcome it. Um, November came and went. December came and went. Uh, this compound that I was on was 500 men. They moved me to the next compound over, which is the main unit. 1,000 men in that prison. And I thought, I guess I'll go to church over here too, even though the food is coming gone. And um, God pressed me, and the Spirit was upon me, and I could feel a thirst, you know. The Bible tells us that blessed are those who thirst and hunger for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. God had lit a fire in my heart that I might know him, that I might know the power of his resurrection, that I might share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is not normal. Um, I'm in a class. This guy's teaching on prayer. Um, he's in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, uh, you haven't asked anything in my name so far, but whatever you ask, I'll do it. I thought, whoa. John chapter 16, Jesus again speaking to, to his disciples. He says, so far you haven't asked the Father anything in my name, but whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll do it so that your joy may be full. I probably just butchered that scripture a little bit, but something like that. Um. As I tried to weigh that, is, is Jesus going to do it or is, or is God going to do it? And that my joy might be full. Um, so as I laid in my bed, it's probably 10 or 11 o'clock at night, the lights are out. Uh, and I was like, Shh. and I'm reminded of, of the prayer that I prayed in that apartment. And I asked God, I said, God, how come you didn't take my life? I asked you in Jesus' name. And he said, son, that still small voice, this is not outside of me, this is not audible. I think God knows that if he would have said it outside of me, if I would have asked the guy in my room, did he hear it? And he said, no, I would have chalked it up. This is from inside. And this is that still small voice that we read about in the Bible. And I said, Lord, why didn't you kill me? I asked you in Jesus' name. And he said, son, because you are already dead. And I wept. And I cried. And as I look back over my life, I thought, what about, I'm married, I have kids. Dead. What about, Dead. We read in the second chapter of Ephesians, and this wouldn't come until later. As I, as I finished my sentence, um, just continuing to read my Bible, um, pray, uh, no clue what I was doing. I was just reading it and reading it and reading it. And uh, As I came to the end of my sentence, I was sitting in the cafeteria with my elbows on my knees, a guy from you know, a, a Christian in there came up to me and he says, you, I see your name's on the board. You, you're getting out soon, man. You don't seem like it. And because I was in Christ, God had set me free inside that prison. I didn't know that there was no freedom outside of Christ. I did not know that. This world can tell us that we're free, but we're not. If we're not in Christ, and I realized that I had been held captive to slavery and sin for 43 and a half years and that God had saved me. Then when I read the second chapter of Ephesians, he's talking to Christians. He's speaking to Christians. 
who have been saved. And it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift, the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you. And here I stand. Dust and grace. <laughs>